good evening. And my name is Kevin Ion. Uh, welcome to Sick and Tired of Being Sick and Tired, Imagining a Healthy, Equitable, and Sustainable Planet. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Savannah Green Team and of the Climate Reality Project of Coastal Georgia, who along with U the UU Church's Anti-Racism Committee and Georgia Interfaith Power and Light are hosting this event. I believe you are in for a special presentation. Many of the practices which have contribute, contributed and continue to contribute to the environmental and climate catastrophe we're experiencing have come at the expense, exploitation, and disregard of indigenous populations and people of color. Our speakers tonight, Hermina Glass-Hill, Dr. Kim Cobb, Helen Ray Latson, and Zach Lyde are here to tell us how that has played out in coastal Georgia and offer ways that we can work together to redress past injustices and stop those continuing environmental injustices that so many still leave with or live with, excuse me. So let me take a moment to introduce our speaker, starting with Hermina. Hermina Glasshill is a creation care steward, scholar, activist, writer, and grassroots organizer in coastal Georgia, guided by the African philosophy of Ubuntu, which is based on the reciprocity of beingness and the interconnectedness of humanity and the environment. She is the founder of the Susie King Taylor Women's Institute and Ecology Center, a nonprofit organization that links the history of chattel slavery to ecological destruction and promotes environmental education. In her role at Gippel, Hermina works with Georgia coastal faith communities to assist with greening their worship practices, whether by coordinating a power wise energy audit or assisting with the launch of a green team. Dr. Kim Cobb of Georgia Tech, her research uses corals and cave stalagmites, stalagmites to probe mechanisms of past, present, and future climate change. She received her bachelor's from Yale University in 1996, her PhD in oceanography from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in 2002. She spent two years at Caltech in the Department of Geological and Planetary Sciences before joining the faculty at Georgia Tech in 2004. Kim has sailed on multiple oceanographic cruises to the deep tropics and led caving expeditions to the rainforest of Borneo in support of her research. She's received numerous awards for her research, uh, most notably a NSF Career Award in 2007 and a Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers in 2008. She sits on the International Clivar Pacific Panel serves on the advisory council for the AAS Leshner Institute of Public Engagement, and is one of the lead authors on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, Six Assessment Report. As a mother of four, Kim is a strong advocate for women in science. She is also devoted to the clear and frequent communication of climate change to the public through speaking engagements and social media. Helen Latson, or excuse me, yeah, Latson, and activist, cultural pres preservationist, and speaker, who is, she is a activist, cultural preservationist, and speaker who is focused on bettering her community through education and liberal arts. A resident of Brunswick, Georgia for 30 years, Ms. Latson's goal is to pour into the community that helps shape her as an individual by developing for youth and family. A member of the Coastal Black Women's Ocean Memory and Conservation Jamboree, Latson has committed her energy to raising her voice to speak for those most affected by climate change and environmental injustice. A member of the Principled Pastors of the Poor Movement, she is co-founder of MAAFA Screams News, a grassroots platform premiering in summer of 2021. And finally, Reverend Zach Lyde was born and raised in Brunswick, Georgia. He served in the U.S. Army from 1958 to 1970 and saw combat in Vietnam in 1967. He returned to Georgia in 1972. An environmentalist, Reverend Lyde, founder of Save the People in 19, or founded uh, Save the People in 1993 to raise awareness and bring change to residents affected by chemtrails and Superfund sites that were left by factories and mills in the city of Brunswick, Georgia. A street preacher activist, Reverend Lyde fights tirelessly for the elimination of poverty, founder of Principal uh, founder of the Principal Pastors of the Poor Movement, Reverend Lyde advocates women leadership in a Confederate state bent on maintaining slavery. Thank you all. And uh, as she said, we're already taking things into um, 
the question box. We'll get to those at the end of the speakers. I'm eager to get into this because it would be a really good program. So let me hand on off just for a moment to Jane Rago, who's the chair of the Anti-Racism Committee of the Unitarian Church. Take it away, Jane. Thank you, Kevin. I just wanna thank everybody for being here tonight and particularly thank Gipple for giving us this really wonderful opportunity to work together. I'm um, so excited about tonight because so often in our mainstream conversations, these the conversations about the environment and about racial equity sometimes only tell half the story and the conjoining, having a full conversation that brings these two not at all disparate, but completely linked together um, concepts into a sharper relief and one that asks us to really think about accountability to each other and equity to each other and also what stewardship means in a larger sense than just the earth but to communities around us and the communities that we are in. So thank you and I'm so excited to hear Hermina Glasshill so I'm going to be quiet now. Um, thank you all so much for joining us uh, this evening. Um, this is a conversation amongst all of us, and um, it will go as such in terms of the format. Um, I want to acknowledge first that um, I'm really grateful to uh, Dr. Cobb, Helen Ray Ladson, and Reverend Dr. Zach Lyde uh, for sharing this moment um, this evening and giving your insights on where we are um, as humans of this planet. I count it all joy to share this moment with you all. I also would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of First Nations people known as the Yamasi and the Hwale. So with that, um, if you are on First Nations people's land, if you want to acknowledge that in the uh, chat, you can do so now. And we are so appreciative of that. I would also like to honor and recognize a woman who is a great ancestor now, and it is in her memory that this presentation is titled, and that is Fanny Lou Hamer. Our mission at Georgia Interfaith Power and Light is to engage communities of faith in stewardship of creation as a direct expression of our faithfulness and as a religious response to global climate change resource depletion, environmental injustice, pollution, and other disruptions in creation. On July 17, 2014, 43-year-old Eric Garner's last words before being killed over a pack of untaxed cigarettes in New York City were, I am tired of being harassed and I can't breathe. On February 23rd, 2020, a 25-year-old young man, Ahmaud Arbery, who was simply ex exercising his God-given right to go into the great outdoors and respire, to breathe, was gunned down like an animal as he jogged in a nearby Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood. On March 13th, 2020, a 26 year old Brianna Taylor was murdered by police while sleeping in bed. On March 25th, 2020, George Floyd, a 43 year old African American male was brutally murdered for having a counterfeit $20 bill last year. And his last words were again, I can't breathe. On December 20th, 1964, at Williams Institutional Church in Harlem, New York City, New York, a 47-year-old Fannie Lou Hamer of Montgomery County, Mississippi, titled her speech to a diverse audience, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And she chronicled the violence and injustice she had received while trying to register herself and others to vote in Mississippi. Whitney, you can play the short clip, please. Thank you.
The man, my opponent, James L. Whitten, has done anything, I mean nothing, to help the Negroes in the second congressional district. How else has Mr. Whitten used his power in the Congress last year? He used it to prevent the distribution of federal commodities in counties throughout the Delta, leaving people hungry, people naked. He's not doing anything for us. And it's time now, as he was not representing all the people because he wasn't representing the Negroes at all. It's time for us to do something about that. And we need your support. We need your vote. Because if I'm elected as Congresswoman, things will be different. We are sick and tired of being sick and tired. For so many years, Negroes have suffered in the state of Mississippi. And we are tired of people saying that we are satisfied because we are everything but satisfied. Thank you for showing that clip, Whitney. Black bodies are and have been on the front lines of social and environmental harm and degradation for decades. Historically and present day, they, Black men, women, and children, as well as Latinos and indigenous folks, have been suffering at inequivalent rates of environmental pollution and injustice compared to whites. These injustices and inequities are not new. They are just being televised and video recorded for the whole world to see the hypocrisies of our brand of democracy. The privilege of clean air, water, and soil is a God-given right that has not just been a priority in our American government or democracy where the people's voices and votes should count. The patterns that almost consistently prevail is race and economics. In global warming, we even see this kind of climate apartheid, this apartness, this segregation. This is where the rich pay to escape heat and hunger caused by escalating climate crisis while the rest of the world suffers. So it's sort of like this neo-colonial plantation where the poor are trapped with no place to go and there are no solutions. But environmental racism refers to how Black, Latino, Indigenous, and low wealth neighborhoods are burdened with the disproportionate numbers of hazards, including toxic waste facilities, garbage dumps, and other sources of environmental pollution and foul odor that lower the quality of life. This can lead to diseases, different diseases, and cancer, and asthma. And because of this, as the fight of climate change worsens, communities of color will continue to be disproportionately affected. According to Green Action, environmental racism is caused by several factors, including intentional neglect the alleged need for a receptacle for pollutants in urban areas, and a lack of institutional power and low land values of people of color. It is a well-documented fact that communities of color and low-income communities are disproportionately impacted by polluting industries, and very specifically, hazardous waste industries, as well as lax regulations of these industries. For more thorough insight, I would suggest you read uh, the work of the father of environmental racism, Dr. Robert Bullard, author of Dumping in Dixie, Race, Class, and Quality. This book continues to be a pathbreaking call for environmental justice in the United States. 
Activist Elizabeth Yin Pierre is an internationally recognized Puerto Rican attorney and environmental climate justice leader of African and indigenous ancestry, born and raised in New York City. She is the co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance and she says, climate change is the result of a legacy of extraction, of colonialism, of slavery. She sees the fight against climate change and racial injustice as deeply intertwined, noting that the transition to a low carbon future is connected to workers' rights, land use, and how people are treated. And she criticizes the mainstream environmental movement, which she says was built by people who cared about conservation, who cared about wildlife, who cared about trees and open space, but didn't care about Black people. The environmental justice movement has broadened the perspective of environment beyond the scope of conservation and preservation of natural resources and has defi defined the environment simply as where we live, where we work, where we play, where we learn, where we pray. Environmental justice refers to those cultural norms and values, rules, regulations, behaviors, policies, decisions to support sustainability where all people can hold with confidence that their community and natural environment is safe and productive. Environmental justice is realized when all people can realize their highest potential without interruption by environmental racism or inequity. Environmental justice is supported by decent paying and secure jobs, democratic decision-making, and finally, personal responsibility and empowerment. A community of environmental justice is one which both cultural and biological diversity are respected and where there is equal access to institutions and ample resources to grow and prosper. Those of us in this work, we should begin to see ourselves as modern day environmental abolitionists. With that, I will begin with a few, of quest few questions. I believe that we all are climate informed as well as climate impacted. Some of us more so in one category than the other, but we are all humans on this planet and we all are impacted. So I'll begin with the question um, to Dr. Kim Cobb first and Helen and Dr. and Reverend Lyde, you all can respond as well. And that is how does weather phenomena like sea level rise, flooding and extreme heat exacerbate uh, ground level and air pollution? Thank you so much for that question, Hermina. And it seriously, it's such an honor to be here, I'm hosted by Gipple, uh, this organization that I've admired for so long and grateful for all of your work and for really holding space for this very important and very timely conversation. Um, to your question, uh, the, the compound threats from, from air pollution, uh, from heat extremes, from environmental hazards that come with flooding in particular, um, these are all raining down on communities that are already exceptionally vulnerable to environmental hazards for decades now, as, as you have well articulated. And so when we think about how specific to your question, uh, temperature exacerbates air pollution. Uh, we know that just from a purely chemical perspective, there are reactions that occur at, at higher temperatures faster and more effectively than they do at lower temperatures. And this exacerbates the pollution around ozone prevalence, uh, a very dangerous uh, air toxin uh, for, for humans that's regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. And speaking to the vulnerability landscape though, when you think about how this lands on communities, you have to understand that asthma is more prevalent in communities of color than in uh, wealthier white communities. And so when you think about what that means for the nexus of 
air pollution, which can be chronic or acute and heat extremes. These are exactly the kind of, of, of you know, pylons that increase vulnerability and are of course going to really put uh, communities of color, historically marginalized communities directly in harm's way with climate change. But I think what I really wanna stress is that is a, a, a factor that is a combination of chronic exposure and vulnerability that we've had baked into, unfortunately, into our society for decades now, that climate change is going to exacerbate going forward. And, and that's really one of the take home messages uh, from uh, the climate justice community. Reverend Lodd or Helen, would you like to respond to that question? I'm not sure that either of them would like to respond, but I'll go to the next question. Mr. Lott is, Mr. Lott is trying to respond. He just has to unmute. Okay. okay. Thank you. Howdy. howdy, howdy, sir. Okay, I'll respond to it in this way. We live in a place where we get our drinking water from the Upper Floridian Aquifer. When you raise the ocean level, by having climate um, pollution and et cetera, what ends up happening, it pushes the graves up out of the, the graveyard and it makes the drinking water capable of killing everyone, including the people who think that they're going to dodge this bullet of climate change by pretending like they are above the ocean because they got a little money. They believe that they're going to be safe from the pollution because they can get on a boat and head to California and then go into a deeper place in the, in the United States where it won't affect them. But I got news for them. If they go there, pollution will find them there. Thank you, Reverend Lyde. Um, how have, and this is for any of you, how have you been a witness to environmental injustice and racism um, in your own experiences? Can you share those experiences? Um, I know that my grandmother was the longest living person in Brunswick, Georgia on dialysis. She had kidney failure. And so here in Brunswick, there are two or three dialysis center, centers in the 90s. I think it started off with one and it has grown over time. We know that, and it's a running joke in the city of Brunswick, that when you're coming out of town, coming from out of town, you know that you're in the city of Brunswick because you can smell it from a mile away. Coming down 341, the stench is gonna meet you and you know where you are. Our communities um, are, surround, are around mills, and in, in, in places that are highly polluting. There are many people who have had to move because of the pollution that their, um, their apartment buildings or uh, homes were built upon. And although they may move to a better place, they still have long lasting um, effects of living in this place. We can't drink the water out of the tap. We spend thousands of dollars every year purchasing bottled water because we know that 
it's safer to bathe in it, but you had, be had better not drink it. And so we know these things in the city of Brunswick, but we, we seem to think that if we are more heavenly minded, that someone, that a divinity or a divine spirit will come and fix it all. When we have to take charge and be earthly good and know that what is happening to our communities, what is happening to our children, what is happening to our parents is wrong. And we have placed our, uh, we have placed our livelihoods in people who do not consider us at all. And that's not only white, that's a black thing as well. And so uh, racism can be a black white thing, but it's also, we suffer from elitism as well, where others feel like they're better than, uh, you have the Pope without the, who can't afford, afford the OR, and then you have the poor who can't afford the OR and they have a little bit more than the Pope. So we have to not only address racism, we have to um, address the elitism in our communities as well. Reverend Lodd, were you going to say something? You're, you're muted, you're back muted. Uh, no, not really. I was satisfied with what Ms. Helen said. I just look, I wanted to kind of add on to that. I think um, it just speak to that. Um, good question because I don't want to let it go unanswered. Um, and, and that is, I think, to speak from the position of uh, somebody who's been late to the realization of uh, the notion of systemic racism, uh, late to the notion of uh, institutionalized racism uh, in our country. And certainly uh, as somebody who has, I think, you know, maybe three or four years ago, um, kind of transitioned into a role of trying to advance climate action at every front wherever I can, um, have also been late to the realization of how wedded uh, climate action is uh, to racial equity and justice. And so, you know, we could go on and on talking about, you know, why I was as late to that realization, but um, recognizing um, that, you know, systemic racism means that, you know, it, a good part of that lives in me as well. And, uh, and an institution that I call uh, my employer in my, my professional home, Georgia Tech, and thinking about how we can, um, you know, work, work to counter that um, in everything that we do is, of course, now, you know, everybody's kind of thinking about that. But you know, what does that actually mean on the ground in the work that we do and the partners that we choose in where we resource and, and, and you know, direct our funding and our time and our efforts? Um, that's where I think this conversation really um, takes life and becomes more than just some truism and aspirations. And so, um, I am, I'm humbled to be a, a life student of, of Dr. Mildred McLean, uh, the director of the Harambe House in, in this pursuit. I'm grateful for her, her patience and her tutelage and, and helping me work towards uh, climate justice uh, for coastal communities, underserved and historically marginalized coastal communities. Uh, I'm grateful for her, um, her, her paving the way and, and building the decades of groundwork that, that allows um, some people like me at Georgia Tech who, who want to, to learn and, and work alongside her um, and, and help her to, 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 to work with her. <laughs> what an honor. So I'll give all those props to her for some of those um, awakenings and hope that there are many more ways for uh, academics like me who are blinded to so much of what we could do that's transformational uh, in hopes that there'll be many more uh, to come, especially as, as climate change becomes a calling to these institutions of higher education. So that's my one little lens on this, but uh, grateful for 
all the previous words. Thank you, Kim. Oh, Reverend Lyde, could you speak to, I'm getting back to Brunswick as this uh, uh, geographic location here on the coast um, that has experienced, as you, you and I have spoken before, uh, the, the most polluted zip code uh, in the state. If you could give us some background on uh, LCP Chemicals and Hercules and the ARCO community and uh, the kind of environmental injustices that residents have experienced, uh, we would like to hear that. Uh, thank you uh, for asking the question. Uh, having been born and raised in Brunswick, and I appreciate the fact that um, that Ms. Dr. McLean's name was actually um, raised and Richard Bullock's name was raised. I would like to raise several other names uh, that I think is extremely important that have passed on. Uh, Connie Tucker, Miss Connie Tucker from Selma, Alabama and Mrs. Ann Braden both worked in a very serious operation called the Southern Organizing Committee. And what ended up happening is if you don't really pay attention to uh, what's going on in communities, then people like myself is actually run from the scene um, because we do get tired and we do get weary and we do not say enough is enough we keep on working uh, as best we can, but what we will do is run away from the structures that have been put in place to so-called bring about a change in the Brunswick area. Brunswick became the most polluted zip code in the state of Georgia based on the fact that um, 27 point 27.5% of the Superfund sites is in this particular zip code. 17 RICO sites is in this particular zip code where they are not managed by the EPA, but managed by EPD. Hundreds of illegal dump sites exist in this community. And so when you have that kind of relationship with death, then what you have to do is you have to reevaluate how you do what you do and how you do it and what you do. What we had to do is because we took on the idea that the government, and when I mean the government, I don't mean um, Republicans or Democrats. I mean the armament that was supposed to protect us, EPA and EPD, was soiled by the oppression that they got from the Confederate forces that wanted to poison the entire community while they moved out of the district over onto St. Simons or Jekyll Island or north from here because they knew that Brunswick had toxophene everywhere. If we went into the parks, toxophene was there. If we went to pray, we had to walk across toxophene laden streets. If we went to shop, we had to pass Superfund sites that had caused young folk to have deformed, and I try to be nice here, Hermina, for you. Uh, so I'm trying to make sure that my words don't disturb you all to the point 
but its reproductive systems ended up being deformed by this toxophene. And toxophene is everywhere. You can't say that toxophene did not get to, to, to St. Simon's because you can't control the wind. You can't say that it can't get to St. Simon's because the water is interconnected. So the people who got the grants to pretend they were going to work on behalf of the poor were put in a position to where they believed that all they needed to do was argue the science and they were safe living where they were and we were gonna bleed and die here as black folk in this criminal environmental injustice system. Our words matter and I have long run away from the idea of environmental justice because if you say environmental justice, then what you're doing is you believe in that somehow you made some advancement against the air, the water, the soil that is polluted. And so I think that our conversations have been too mild, too weak, and too compromising to be able to bring about the difference that we need to make in all of these communities especially when we talk about the notion that the po, my girl was clever when she say the po and the poor, the poor was black folk. The po is the folk who have been tricked into believing that they are white. So they're going to be able to move into the higher class one day if they just keep their mouth shut or do the bidding that the, the, the powerful and the politicians want them to do. I could speak for hours on how we will raise smelliness. I need to say it, sister. Can I go and say smelliness doo-doo? I can, I, can, I can raise the issue to how we drank the water. I can tell you how my granddaddy worked at Hercules and came back when I graduated from high school and said, son, please do not go to work to Hercules. They have almost killed me. And I personally want to come here to your graduation and beg you not to work to Hercules because they have been destroying the lives of people. Hercules, people look at toxophene, but they don't look at, they, they don't look at Agent Orange, which they also uh, developed. Hercules had 17 military manufacturing operations across this nation. That was what they was into it for. That's what they did. They started with gunpowder. And I can tell you, we have lived with it all of these 82 years I've been here. Hermina, we can't hear you, just so you know. Oh, uh, Reverend Lai, can you speak to uh, the uh, uh, ARCO community that uh, emerged around these toxic uh, facilities, industrial sites? I, I can tell you, speaking to you about ARCO, my mother was born and raised out there. And uh, you had to be careful what you asked for. ARCO 
became a community that was segregated in its living quarters because Arco Oil um, was the was the major um, business in that particular area. So they built housing for black folk and housing for white folk. And when they built the housing, one was on one side of the road and one was on the other side of the road. And so the poverty increased on the side in which my mother was born and raised in. The poverty did not decrease with the, in the side where the Caucasians lived, but the poison in the area intensified. And the reason it intensified is because after our co oil left, there were other operations that came into existence at the um, LCP site or where Arco, Arco Oil actually existed. Around it came a organ, operation called Georgia Pacific. Around it came an operation called LCP, Linden Chemicals and Plastics. Linden Chemicals and Plastics came into existence because they were going to assist Georgia Pacific in making the product that they have, which is the which which is the largest chlorine bleach paper plant in the world, become white paper. And they used a manufacturing operation called that used mercury in order to develop that chlorine that was piped over to, to um, Georgia Pacific. You have to be careful what you ask for because we went out there and prayed at, at Georgia Pacific, took them on and we didn't have the resources, nor did we have the dedication from our white counterparts to work with, work, with, work with us at the level that you need to work at to get rid of poison. You can't play with these people. You can't come in there talking about what you want to do is argue about uh, uh, um, particulate matter and how much uh, we will be able to live with. When the mercury is falling into the ground 275 feet, rolling over into the, 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 the Brunswick River, poisoning the, the shrimp, the crab, the fish, leaving LCP one of the biggest operations now that exist in the Arco area with Honeywell over there because they are one of the people that was in that particular region now trying to take on the idea that they are going to clean up LCP and make it a brown field. Be careful what you ask for because we went to, to wrestle with all of them, didn't have the resources. David Koch and his brother, I think Charles, who is dead now, bought Georgia Pacific. They destroyed all of the white housing over there. They left the, the, the black housing intact. I believe that what is going on now is that there is a an attempt at having folk with the grant money come in with Honey, Honeywell, buy the properties up, send the black folk who live there, the poor black folk who live there in trailers somewhere deep into the woods so that what can happen is we will be forever kept impoverished in this particular community. Thank you for that, uh, Reverend Lyde. As you can see that, you know, the intersection of the inter intersectionality of um, race and um, environmental pollution, which leads to, you know, economic challenges in regards to employment, education, uh, uh, adequate housing, 
um, and the ability to um, live sustainably uh, when you are a coastal people uh, like African Americans, uh, known as Gullah Geechee people on the coast, who have relied on um, their daily sustenance from the uh, the land, from the waterways, um, and you have uh, consumer advisories posted throughout, and you find families that are fishing all the time. Um, how do you see um, these kinds of experiences playing out in um, in, in your communities, um, Helen and Reverend Lyle? I see them playing out. Uh, I see them playing out when you go to the schools and almost every, uh, about 75 to 80% of those children in that school it, are on some form of medication to make sure that they are, excuse me, I, Excuse me. Okay, sorry, I had I heard an echo. When you go to our schoolhouse and you see that about 80% of our children are on medication because they can't focus or you label them with ADHD, um, you have children that are always um, are that they, they can't participate in physical education because they have asthma. Uh, how do we see it? We see it when um, you have a crab boil every weekend, but you know that not only are the, not only is the seafood contaminated, the water that you're boiling your seafood in is contaminated. How do we see it? We see it with dialysis centers everywhere. Um, we see it with, we have, we have stores everywhere, but they don't have the, the right nutrients or the right food to be so. We have a corner store on every corner and it is, um, and all there is is junk food or uh, anything that's wrapped in plastic. We don't have any raised bed gardens. We have, you know, we see it all the time. Uh, in so many ways and so many instances where projects have the, uh, they, they, we inspire for these wonderful projects to come and help in our community, but in the middle of the, pro the progress being made, it just stopped, it comes to a complete stop. So there were the opportunity to raise the vibration in the community, the opportunity to uh, make the community better, uh, it, it, it stops because it is, it's given to a, a community that seems to be better or needs to have it more than the community that really needs it. Um, we've had seven splots in our community, uh, in um, the city of Brunswick, and not one has gone to the betterment of the city of Brunswick, where the taxes are raised for the poor people but no, none of that tax money is going to help to uh, influence the infrastructure or help uh, raise the vibration in the community. So we see it all the time. Um, if we wanna get historical in 1955, when we had the, uh, when Dwight, I, Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower uh, said yes to the interstates being built in the middle of African-American communities. It wasn't a big deal until lead poisoning started to affect the affluent communities. So where do we see it? We see it all the time. And instead of us uh, going and uh, confronting the people who are actually in charge of it, as uh, Dr. Cobb stated, systemic racism, we, pit, we fight against one another. And so we're not only, our land is not only sick, our food is not only sick, we are sick. We are mentally unable to fight the foe. And so we, we see it all the time. 
I hope I answered your question. You did, thank you. Reverend Law, did you want to respond to that? Or Kim? Yes. Thank you. Um, I had to come from outdoors so you could see me. Um, well, the birds were chirping so really beautifully. Dark. The birds were your choir. They were chirping so beautifully with you. And I had to come inside before this thing blew up. <laughs> okay. So therefore the question you asked, how do we see, I guess, our future in this? Is that the question? Uh, how, how do you see um, the injustices playing out in your everyday lives? What did she say? And, and how the, is this, is, is, okay, this is oh. I, I yeah, spoke okay. about. Um, I'm, glad, I'm glad. Go ahead. I'm glad for that one. How does injustice affect us in our every, everyday lives? Everything around us is criminal. We live in a in in what is known that Hill and I and I have have um, labeled as the sanctuary of corruption. If you go to the federal courts, corruption is there. If you go to if you go to the um, high schools, corruption is there. You may not know it, but one of the oldest high schools in this country is here in Glen County. They have saved their history brick by brick, building by building, including going all the way from Sterling to bring a building that was built in the 1800s back into the, that was, that was shipped out in 19, I think 15 or something to that. They, they brought it back into the Brunswick area so that their history could play out. Well, our history has been absolutely destroyed. We were the salt of the earth. When a lot of people had to march, march to vote, we didn't. When a lot of people had to beg for crumbs, crumbs from the rich man's table, we were in the green book. The reason we was in the green book is because we was on the chitlin circuit. Helen and I have started what we call hot stank. So that what we can do with hot stank is we can present the destruction of the evil that exists in this nation and people feeling guilty about it but not actually doing anything about it except having conversations. So we ran away from conversations and Helen has been trying to bring me back to conversations because I was out there as a minister making a decision that the old theology that we practice dealing with the idea of forgiving, forgetting, and loving was not working. That we needed to in fact see Jesus for just what he is, a thug. And as a thug, we know that thugs don't give up easy. As Tupac Sakur, who is a prophet in our church, ask the folk who in fact can tell you that if you work with the poor, at the level that we are working with them at, and women, including white women, see y'all been left out, beating the pieces and think that y'all don't, that y'all don't need our help, but I know better. See, if we don't get rid of white male privilege and black male uh, compromise, what we gonna end up with is this trash forever. Therefore, Principal Pastors of the Poor Project came into existence to do two things. Work with women. Thank you for being on glass. Work with the fact that we believe that if women are given their proper respect and we don't walk with them against them, like the Catholic says, women can't preach in their pulpits. 
and the Baptists say that women can't put preach in their pulpits. We've watched women go through all of that lynching and craziness that have caused us to be where we are and not have male counterpart uh, figures working with them. So we, with the principal pastors of the Poor Project, we are dedicated to working with women as our leaders. And we are dedicated to eliminating poverty. So if you wanna go with us, slow with us, I will quit, quit cursing because that's what Hermina begged me not to do. See, because if, if it was left up to me, you feel my anger. If it was left up to me, you'd see my anger. If you was left up to me, EPA done saw it, EPD done saw it. They done done everything they could to prevent us from getting rid of this criminal system they got, including there was a guy by the name of Walter McNeil. He dead now, poor thing. They picked him to be on the EPD board so that he would be able to prevent us from standing tall in front of them. We ain't going nowhere, ask the federal government. But what we ain't going to do is we ain't going to follow the leadership of weak folk who don't know that looking at science ain't the only way to look at this. The way to look at this is from the noses, from the ears, from the eyes, from the places like Arco and Brunswick, look directly into the eyes of these folk and say, look, let us work together and find solutions together and quit playing. We did have, because of Hermina and Paulina, what's her name, Paul? We Paulina. had a visitor, yeah, Paulita. We had a visitor from the state of, what was that state? Rhode Island? Rhode Island. Kim was a part of that too, Reverend Lott. Yeah, the white boy came right on down and sit with us in the park crossed his legs and he heard us. Now what we believe is that we need to bring him back, Warnock, because we know he done run from the Gullah Geechee community up there to that so-called church where they want peace at, and Asaf, the Jewish guy, bring them all back down here so that they could learn the problem instead of deciding that they have the solutions without looking directly at the problems for the changes that we need. If they come, I guarantee you their enlightenment will change. We appreciate Dr. McLean. We appreciate Dr. Bullitt. But I can assure you, if you smell what we smell all them years and they told us, this is what they told us, don't do nothing. That's the smell of bacon and eggs. We had to tell them, you are liars. That's the smell of death. We know death when we see it. We, we looked it in the face. We saw our babies dying from it. We see people right now who did not want to listen to us dying right now from the poison that they received from those plants because they thought that they was making a living off of it when they was actually making a death off of it. There you go. Get me off of that. So, so where do you where do you see us going from here, Kim, Helen, Ray, uh, Helen Ray, and um, Reverend Lott? What, what what is what are some of the solutions as we look for um, a, a healthy way of imagining our world, uh, an equitable and and just way of um, of um, envisioning a world. Um, in which we all uh, have to live. And as you all have said, there's no escaping uh, the climate crisis. We, we, it's, it, it, there's a, the matter, the term that I used was uh, climate apartheid, where, where those who can afford um, uh, to, to cool themselves uh, will do that and others will be um, refugees left behind. What do you all see as some of the solutions uh, for a sustainable planet? What will it take for us to hold one another together 
um, as we move forward? Um, what I think we ought to stop doing is lying to one another. That's the first thing. In order to stop lying to one another, we have to take control of the media. You see, the media has a tendency to want to uh, compromise any position that's being taken to lie about the notion of neutrality. They ain't neutral. What they are is they making money off of advertising and, and, the, and the people that pollute us. So we need to take control of the media in which we need to teach and organize from. That is why co-founder Helen Latson and I co-founded Ma'afa Screams News, meaning slave revolt, screaming news that is not lying to folk about the existence of this corrupt system in which we live in. Democracy has lines, you know. And those lines are very, very ingrained and deep. And those lines represent one, the power brokers who control all the wealth, two, the people who are in the middle who are called the so-called politicians. And we put the preachers in that category. And those of us who have to look at our babies with asthma, learning disabilities, this, uh, this de de deformed um, reproductive systems, eyes uh, can't see. We are looking at this straight in its face. We need people to look with us. When we started in this movement with Save the People, the people who was in the environmental movement did not even want us in. They didn't like the fact that what we did was we confronted EPA. They didn't like EPA being told that we ain't gonna wait on them not one more, one more second to, to clean, clean, clean this up. What we gonna do from here in, in North Carolina Central, we going back to Brunswick. We gonna put on weapons. We gonna arrest the polluters. We gonna have, and we gonna do citizens arrest for them. We are going to have citizens um, justice operations in our courts. We were gonna put them in our jails until something changed in our community. When we got back here from 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 challenging EPA in in, in Durham, they arrested three people within three months. Now, I know that's not cute for everybody, especially, uh, I ain't gonna come up there and say that to, to, to Georgia Tech, cause see, they'll be done fired you, Carl, you be gone. <laughs> we, we, we know how, how, how people, when they look and say, you know, um, Reverend Lyde says it, and what he says is not, uh, not he's saying it, it's, it's the truth. He just ain't saying it like he ought to say it. He ought to compromise before he negotiate. And then what happens is he can tell folk that what he's gonna do is accept uh, the fact that the the Cobb, the, the, uh, the um, Daniel, what's it with the David, the, them folk that bought the Glen, uh, Georgia Pacific, <laughs> that we gonna accept what they have decided that they gonna put on us. No, we ain't gonna accept it. And we ain't gonna sit with 100 miles without them knowing that what happens is we are in this all the way together. We ain't gonna sit down with 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 Glenn Environmental Coalition and let Daniel Parsley and others believe that they can measure uh, the, the the particular matter that we could live with. We ain't doing that. We're gonna say the poison is the poison. It's killing us. We need for us to be able to sit down and come up with solutions that comes from the from the minds of the poor who suffer in this stuff. So, so what kind of policy changes are you looking for as part of the, the solution? Well, and one of the policy changes that you definitely need 
is EPA and EPD not allowing the, 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 the uh, polluters to uh, regulate themselves. That's one of the policy changes you, you definitely need. One of the other policy changes you need is to be serious about elections and get rid of some of them people who playing games like uh, that that uh, dumb uh, 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 so-called representative who got all that money uh, representing us. At, his name is uh, Buddy Carter Jr. I guess that's his name. Uh, with all of that money, we need to make sure that the 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 the, the um, mayor of the city of Brunswick understand how ignorant he is when he tells us that what when we ask, we thank him for living in the poorest ass, excuse me, I almost said it, the poorest city in the state of Georgia, he tell us that what happens is don't believe the hype because being poor is in your mind, that's his theology. We need to make sure that the people we put in office on a policy level are challenged not with some nice words and, and humble beginnings, we need to put them on blast and that's what my office Scream News is going to do. That is what PPPP going to do. That's what we expect that if you going to work with us from UU, that's what you going to do. I got a friend here with UU who uh, retired as a UU preacher here in Glen County. He started out over in Birmingham as a Baptist, Southern Baptist preacher. Trust me, I wish he was on here with me tonight because he has convinced me that there are people out there like you use that really are serious about doing this work. So if you're serious, come on down. If you're serious, tell, tell uh, uh, Sheldon Whitehouse to come on visit. If you're serious, tell uh, uh, Warnock to come out the pulpit, get that mess off him that he, that he wear, come on down. Tell us off that we know that there's a problem on sadness uh, with him coming down, but we will make sure that in the evening, when the sun go down, we will uh, accommodate him coming down here. We want folk who are serious about this mess. Cause if they ain't, guess what? The sea's gonna rise, the sun gonna get hotter. Now, I could pray on y'all because I'm a preacher. I pray on y'all that y'all y'all ain't got enough melanin, and they'll burn y'all the, the heck on up. And our little black skin to keep us actually surviving through the process. If the if since we can't drink the ocean, ocean please go down. You see, we have ways that we can talk to the Lord to fix this thing for us. If y'all don't come on, let's get it done. Are there any, uh, thank you, Reverend Lyde. Are there any other um, solutions that you would like to contribute, Kim or Helen? Um, as of now, as of now, uh, we are in the process of being able to start off with 60, 60 residents in the Brunswick Housing Authority, uh, educating them on water, the water, the air pollution that is going on. Uh, many, many times we, we overlook people in these communities because we think that they won't understand, but they will. Um, and we, we have to educate them on how important and significant they are. Although the people in, uh, in um, lower income communities have a smaller carbon, carbon footprint, we still have to drink uh, out of bottled waters uh, and those bottles add up to pollution. And a bottle, a uh, water bottle can only be reused or recycled twice. So we have to educate them that we need to invest in uh, reusable water bottles. Um, and we would also like to bring water filtration systems into their homes. So we're gonna start with 60 and we're uh, hoping to uh, double that every year because we did the housing communities were 
built in the 1950s. The uh, pipes have not been changed since. And we have to uh, let them know that yes, drinking water or purified water is healthier for you because of the pollution, but the bottles are polluting our, our waters. Um, I have been so honored to be a part of the Black Women's Ocean Memory and Conservatory. Uh, thank you so much. And we have, we have to understand our connection to marine life as well. We have to understand that we are, we have to stop teaching individuality that, you know, you're, you're this, yes, you are special. Yes, you are wonderful. Yes, you are fantastic, but you are a part of the whole and this whole needs you. And what we do as individuals affects the whole. So we have to start including people um, I think that we teach individualism and it makes people think that we are all on these, uh, that we're on these islands by ourselves, that, you know, what you do does not affect me. And that's a lie. And so we have to realize that, yes, I am an individual, but what I do affects my neighbor. What I do is going to affect my neighbor's children. Uh, many times we want to only worry about our children but we should be more involved in the friends that our children keep because they are going to they are going to influence how our children behave so we have to be able to not only tell our children about recycling and re, uh, reusing and reducing we have to tell our children's friends we have to tell our children's parents about the importance of recycling, the importance of keeping our areas and our climate clean. So we have to start with conversations and allowing people to know that you are important, no matter where you live in, in, in this city, you are important and we need you to be a part of this whole. Well, I, I don't have a, a lot to add to, to those uh, calls to action, which um, you know, I, I, I certainly second. I would like to talk a little bit, and I think this resonates with what both the Reverend and, and Helen have been talking about around, you know, how do we, how do we create, um, you know, hubs for engagement, for moving forward? How do we um, work with existing networks and, and partners to uh, envision something that could be 10 years in the future, if we work together towards that thing, what, what does that look like? Uh, what do folks want to see? How do we take the problems of today and, and turn them into opportunities? And I wanted to uh, talk about something that we have uh, possibly growing in Savannah, which is um, started around uh, these sea level sensors, which is helping us keep an eye on uh, coastal flooding and then the patchwork that it, it shows up as frankly, and, and keep an eye for keeping people safe and people's, people's livelihoods safe today, but also starting to some really important conversations with the city and the county about what's going to happen in 10 years, what's going to happen in 20 years, what's going to happen in 30 years, what about this development that you just green lighted, what about this planning process that's considering where to put that next biggest development. Uh, who's who's at the table? What data are you using? Uh, how are you working through this process? And so we've quickly moved from, hey, these sensors are going to solve all the problems to, you know, these sensors are really not even almost the problem itself. The problems are already been here for decades, as, as have been so beautifully articulated here. And when we think about working with communities like uh, Hudson Hill and, and Dr. McLean, you know, we hear about the air pollution. We hear about the proximity to, to environmental hazards that can come washing into their communities during these flood events that they worry about uh, day in, day out. Uh, we hear about all of the uh, corridors of, of truckers coming by in and out of the port all the time uh, across the crisscross in their community. Um, and so we hear about the lead in the soils and how they, they can't build the raised beds that they would like to, to build uh, urban, urban farming for their communities and engage their youth. We hear about how uh, their, fe their fear for their young people, how they're not certain what kind of job prospects they will have, that they, they hope that they get the skills training that they need, that they hope that they stay. 
uh, when we talk to the pinpoint Gullah Geechee community about their priorities around climate change, uh, they help us understand that uh, they're losing their young people. They're losing the land that they live on, that they have lived on for centuries. They help us understand that they don't even know what's in their water and how climate change might affect that. They help us understand how they can't fish in the same places anymore and they can't uh, have any livelihoods anymore that like they used to and that they're worried about these things. And so, you know, when we think about wrapping our arms around all these issues, we're talking about bringing history with us and, and creating a vision that incorporates that history and all of the local expertise and the lived experience and the inherent resilience of these communities in charting a path for climate resilience that is a found, at the foundation of which is climate justice and equity, at the foundation of which is racial justice and equity, by the way. And so when we think about how we build these, these, these hubs up, this is what they call them at uh, the National Science Foundation, we applied for an $18 million grant, uh, Coastal Equity and Resilience Hub to National Science Foundation. Thankful for the partnership with Dr. McLean, as well as Hanif Haynes and the Pinpoint uh, community up there. And, you know, I don't know if we're going to get it because, you know, what the National Science Foundation says, well, that's not really hypothesis driven research, Dr. Cobb, you know, and so, <laughs> and so we say, well, you know, we're going to build it anyway. And, and how do I feel like we might be able to build these things going forward is here's on my necklace, actually, I don't know if y'all can read this, but it says vote. And I got this necklace ahead of the 2020 election you know, because I needed all the energy I could get. And I thought if I got a daily reminder, I might be reminded how important it is, uh, this historic election in, in fall of 2020. And then I couldn't take it off because I had to keep it through January 5th. And now I'm just keeping it on because you know what? Uh, we all learned a powerful lesson about how important it is to, uh, to have leaders who, who will act on these issues, who will center environmental justice and climate action who will move to address the historic injustices as we make deep investments in our future. And so I was happy to see the new administration outline a bold plan for uh, investing exactly in those kinds of programs that blend these spaces together so that we can move forward together, not just a couple folks moving forward, but hopefully everybody moving forward. And so I know that's a bold vision. And I know that, you know, we only had the clock is ticking up in DC right now. Um, Reverend, I'd, I'd love to work with you to, to bring those officials down to the coast and show them uh, what resilience looks like. Because <laughs> it's here and it's been here, at, as you know, right? And, and to help them share in a vision for what we could do to help Georgia be a absolutely international showcase for coastal equity and justice in the face of climate change. Because I, to my opinion, we have all the pieces that we need already here on the coast. And we have all the people already kind of connecting together. You know, what, what we're really missing is the, the, the love and the light from DC in the form of some deep investments that can help this work take flight and help create frameworks that can be scalable and translatable across this country and beyond. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give that plug and we're gonna keep working at Georgia Tech. We're gonna keep working with our partners on the coast. Um, we're gonna keep thinking about how far technology can take us, but we know that can all, technology cannot take us anywhere <laughs> without people. <laughs> and so we'll be working with the people and uh, we are already talking to folks down in Brunswick, and I hope that we can have some partners emerging from this call tonight uh, to help us build capacity, not just in Savannah, Chatham County, but uh, down in, in Brunswick and Glynn County as well. And so I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic, and I'm not gonna give up. Great, thank you so much for that, Kim. Um, I think that um, we'll take a few questions Whitney, do you, have you noted questions? I have not paid attention to the chat box. A few, we only have a couple of minutes for a few questions. Um, I haven't noted, let me look through, just to make sure. OK, 
Kevin asked, do you have a campaign to put pressure on our senators to come down and listen and learn? Um, which I think we talked about a little bit, but if you guys want to expand on that. Uh, I will expand on it. And first of all, Cobb, uh, you don't mind me calling you Cobb because see, I don't want to disrespect any woman because see, we need y'all. We, we believe that we're going to be walking beside you. Uh, but we do, we'll take your, your, your help in bringing them down for education. Policy-wise, I do believe that we ought to take, uh, attack the education system itself for a curriculum that makes a difference than the Confederate lies that's been told. Um, and so um, I do believe that if you would, Kevin, um, and get involved with us and we can get you involved in, with this you, you preacher down here and Jane Page, we call in her name because we gonna call her out if she don't work with us, I'm telling you. I know Jane. I know her too, and we gonna yeah. make sure that they know that we tired of letting, letting folk compromise before they negotiate, talking about some good trouble. Good trouble is a absolute mess. It has nothing to do with what you got to do in order to get rid of this poison and get this water and uh, uh, the, the, this climate change fixed. You can walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but you can't take that whole ocean in uh, and believe that what you're going to do is have a good life. Thank you, Dr. Reverend Lai. Is there any other questions, um, Whitney? But feel free to put your camera on and to unmute. You're welcome to ask questions of our panel. Uh, Whitney, let me ask one question, kind of a follow-up to the one that I had here. I mean, sure. this has actually been uh, so overwhelming tonight that um, I'm wondering, you know, I mentioned uh, putting pressure on the senators and, and some sort of campaign of that, but um, concrete things that viewers tonight can do to, you know, help, um, you know, in a concrete way. It's, um, and I understand uh, political pressure is one way to do it. And I'm just wondering if there are other things that uh, would be useful. Yes, um, Sheldon Whitehouse actually came. We need for you to come before we invite the big guns to come down so that you can see the monument that we are trying to put up based on the racism that was created by uh, for returning veterans coming from World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, like I, like I came from and being mistreated. Um, and uh, if you can sit at that monument, you can get a flavor of uh, what it is that we actually need to do in order to make sure we compel them to come to Brunswick. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Come down and look. You can join us in the efforts of uh, raising the awareness in the Brunswick Housing Authority, where you know we are now starting to uh, raise, raise funds to make sure that we have enough water filtration systems, um, where we have uh, people who will come and speak to the to the residents of the housing authority um, to to show that not only are we here to educate you but we're here to help you as well. Um, there are, there are many ways uh, you can join us in in uh, conversations like these uh, when we when we present to the residents of the housing authority. Um, it's not about you know. Uh, lullabying them but convincing them and and letting them know how imperative their their presence is in the community and so you can help us with uh you can help us with with literature 
to give them, uh, where we can give back uh, bags full of uh, education to uh, literature and education to them. Uh, you can donate uh, reusable straws. You can, there's so many things that we can do to help in efforts because we're taking baby, small baby steps. Um, a lot of times, you know, we think that we have to do big things um, to help others, but it's really the small things where we want lasting change. We don't want this to just be a fly by fly by night uh, situation where we only do this once. We want to make sure that all of, there are five public housing authorities in the city of Brunswick, if I'm not mistaken, five to six public housing authorities. Um, uh, donate your time, adopt, adopt a, a housing uh, complex, uh, give, give information to them. It's just so many ways that you could help us. Thank you for that. Teresa, Teresa Grady, you, 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 you ran away from us to New York. Get off the, get off the air. We don't need, we don't need people who done made a decision to abandon us and then come get on a conference virtually from hundreds of miles away and say, you gonna help us. We want people who want to actually get involved in this fight, stay in this fight and let's get busy because what has happened is the games have been played too long. Big steps is what we do need. We don't need your straws, I don't. <laughs> Uh, uh, by the way, you all, um, Reverend Lyde and Teresa are friends, so it's not like he's talking to a stranger. <laughs> but I, I do want to thank you all for your time this evening. We have uh, opened up a, a conversation um, and dialogue that we would like to continue here on the coast in regards to how do we mitigate, adapt, and respond to climate change and environmental pollution. And as Reverend um, uh, Lai has stated, we don't want to sugarcoat it. Let's call environmental racism what it is. Let's uh, uh, begin to work together in ways in which um, we mitigate these issues that's impacting all of us, um, black, white, uh, brown, uh, indigenous folks, it's, uh, it's impacting all of our lives. But we are, we who are conscientious of um, tomorrow and we who live with hope that uh, tomorrow will come, um, let us work together um, with coastal communities in terms of um, what they have stated their needs are. Oftentimes you have these very top heavy um, uh, policies and solutions, but if we are working with coastal communities, grassroots community in which they are communicating to us what their needs and desires are, because as you've, as you've seen from these presentations, um, we are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Everybody's sick and tired of being sick and tired. And climate change, it doesn't have any boundaries. It's coming for us all. Climate change doesn't know that you live in uh, 30320 or that I live in 31320. Uh, it, it doesn't know that. It doesn't have any boundaries. And just because we, uh, uh, there are those among us who have uh, the advantage of um, fleeing from climate change. It does not mean that we all should not be responsible as Helen said uh, for our neighbors. And so with that, I thank you all for joining us tonight. You